Hi everyone. This week we're going to talk about Buddhism. Buddhism is um, a religion that developed in the Indus Valley in what is modern day India, Pakistan, a little bit of Afghanistan, and perhaps bleeding into China a little bit, uh, and also Nepal. So that, that whole uh, subcontinent of South Asia is where Buddhism originated, along with its sister religions, the other Dharmic religions, or they're sometimes called the Vedic religions, of Jainism, which we talked about last week, Hinduism, which we'll talk about next week, and Sikhism, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. So, uh, the civilization in the Indus Valley, the Indus is a river that gives the name to India, uh, although today it's actually mostly, it mostly flows through Pakistan, but uh, Pakistan was traditionally part of India. So the uh, civilization in the Indus Valley dates as far back as at least the third millennium BCE. Um, apparently the people who lived there first, at least at the, as far back as we can go, uh, followed the cult of the mother goddess. The mother goddess was uh, common, uh, commonly worshipped throughout that part of the world throughout Europe, throughout the ancient Near East as well. And this is evidenced by uh, female figurines that have been discovered by archaeologists and other people. Um, so invaders from the West, from the steppes of, uh, of uh, Asia, from uh, the Iranian plateau and elsewhere, invaded the uh, Indus Valley uh, eventually. And they brought with them Indo-European languages. Um, the Indo-European language that they brought was the forerunner of Sanskrit, and the modern languages of Hindi and Urdu are also descended from this language. And the language that they spoke was also a sister language of a branch of Avestan, which is the language of the Zoroastrian scriptures. And it's also the uh, sister language uh, to Farsi, which is a modern Persian language. These uh, invaders not only brought language and culture, they brought weaponry, especially the horse-drawn chariot. Later on, they brought iron smelting with them uh, from the west into the Indus Valley. And they also brought religious ideas, and that's what is mostly going to concern us um, in our discussions in this class. So what kind of religious ideas did they bring? They brought ideas of various sky gods, that is, gods who lived in the heavens, and they also brought various priestly traditions. And this mixture of these uh, Western uh, religious ideas with the, you know, mingling with the uh, ideas that were already there in the Indus Valley gave rise to what is called the Vedic religion. And the Vedic religion is the forerunner of Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism. Uh, early Vedic literature was written about this time, uh, this time being the mid to late second millennium BCE. Uh, the oldest uh, piece of Vedic literature is the Rig Veda, which contains a number of, of hymns to various gods. And there are other Vedas as well. Um, that, and all, these, all of these, as I say, date from the middle of the second millennium to the end of the uh, second millennium BCE, so between like 1500 and 1000 BCE. Uh, the Vedic religion included the worship of devas. Devas are shining ones, that's what the word means in Sanskrit, and devas is related to the word deus, the Latin word for God, and theos, the Greek word for God. So uh, this uh, proto-Indo-European word gave uh, root to these other kind of modern or more modern uh, names for God. So uh, the religious ideas and traditions of the Vedic uh, people continue to develop in the first millennium BCE. And eventually, uh, another group of writings called the Upanishads began to be written in the first millennium BCE. And these were interpretations of the older Vedic material. So Turn that around there. Okay, so the, uh, the Rig Veda is the oldest of these Vedic uh, documents, dates to the second millennium BCE, and then the Upanishads 
are interpretations of the Rig Veda, and they go beyond uh, the Rig Veda in some ways. It's similar to the way that uh, you can think of the New Testament as an elaboration on the Old Testament for Christians, or for Jews, you can think of the Mishnah and the Talmuds as elaborations of the uh, of the Hebrew Scriptures and so forth. And um, so the, the tradition, like all religious traditions, continued to develop over the centuries. Well, after a while, during the Axial Age, which, remember, was between about 800 and 200 BCE, this uh, the, the Vedic tradition that was rooted there in the Indus Valley came into contact with a reform movement called the Sramana Traditions. We talked about this last week when we talked about Jainism. The Sramana Traditions, just let me remind you, these were uh, traditions that included asceticism, belief in the existence of the soul uh, that could be translated from one life to the next, the transmigration of, of souls or samsara. Um, and the soul was called the Atman. That was the, um, the Sanskrit name for it. And also the quest for freedom, moksha, liberation from samsara, the cycle of life, death, rebirth, and so forth. This was something that was common to the Sramana movements and they manifested in themselves, they blended with the older Vedic tradition in various ways. So this week we'll talk about how Buddhism blended the Shramana uh, traditions with the older Vedic traditions and what uh, ideas they came up with. Now, when the, this new group of people uh, entered the Indus Valley, bringing their new traditions with them, there were at least a couple of different um, reactions to it. One was military involvement and uh, the other was religious seeking. So remember I said that these people coming from the West brought new military traditions, uh, horses and chariots and things like that. And so this developed into, you know, eventually the caste system in that part of the world. And there was a warrior class of people that um, uh, their, their job, their duty was to fight in battles. And also uh, religious wandering, trying to uh, find enlightenment, trying to find truth, meditation, withdrawal from the world. This was another reaction. And the Buddha was one of these wanderers uh, who arose during this, this time period. Um, now, in the West, we tend to view history as a series of specific events that go in a straight line, a linear series, whereas uh, in the East, especially in India, the traditional way of looking at history is as a part of the endless cycle of the cosmos, which exists eternally. When we talked about Jainism, we talked about these um, this span of, of, of centuries, a millennia, really. Uh, what was it? 126,000 years, I think it was. Uh, the, the Earth goes through this big cycle, and then it starts over again, and starts over again, and this goes on forever. Uh, this was uh, typical, not always 126,000 years, but the idea in a, uh, the belief in a cyclical view of history was pretty typical of people uh, who arose out of the Indus Valley civilizations. So let's talk about the Buddha. Who was the Buddha? First of all, you notice I'm calling him the Buddha. Sometimes people just say Buddha as though it were a name, and that's fine. Um, but it is not a name. Originally, it wasn't a name. It's, uh, it was a title, just like Christ in Christianity uh, was originally a title. It meant the anointed one. And uh, the prophet in, Muhammad, uh, in uh, Islam is uh, a description of the prophet Muhammad. So the Buddha was a, um, a name that was given to this individual, and it means one who has awakened. And uh, the Sanskrit word for someone who is bound for enlightenment, that is someone who will achieve enlightenment in this lifetime, is a bodhisattva. Let me write it up here for you. Bodhisattva is someone who is destined for enlightenment, and there are many different bodhisattvas. And so in that sense, there are many different Buddhas. But the one that is the best known is the one we are talking about uh, right now. His name originally was Siddhartha Gautama.
Sir Arthur Gautama, and he was from, he was born into a, uh, a rich family during the uh, 6th uh, century BCE, uh, or perhaps early 5th century, depending on, on, on who you ask. He was born at a little town called Lumbini in modern-day Nepal, which the, there was no separate state of Nepal back in, back in his time. Uh, so he was born into a royal family, or at least a leading political family, and he was married, and he had a son. And as, the, as a member of the local aristocracy, he would have been trained in religious law and custom, statecraft, you know, politics, uh, grammar, logic, other arts and sciences, just as um, wealthy and um, politically advantaged individuals in other parts of the world also uh, would have been trained in the, uh, the various uh, levels of knowledge of their day. And so, so he was, and he was a member of the warrior caste that I spoke about a while ago. And because he was a member of the warrior caste, he would have been expected to have either a military or a political career. And this training, when he was a young man, a boy and a young man, led him to be comfortable in speaking with kings and aristocrats that he met on his journeys later on in life. So when he was um, 29 years old, he left his family, and he, that is his wife and his son, and he embarked on a journey of discovery that lasted six years. At the end of those six years, he received enlightenment. And after that point, he was 35 years old. After that point, he was known as the Buddha. And he spent the next 45 years traveling throughout northeastern India, teaching his views. And he finally died at the age of 80, having achieved nirvana. Uh, nirvana is reala realization of non-self, the, the realization that you're not really a, a being at all. Uh, so uh, Buddhists differ from Hindus uh, in, the, in their attitude towards the Atman or the soul, Hindus believe that the Atman is what is transferred from life to life to life um, through reincarnation, whereas Buddhists deny that the Atman really even exists, but one aspect of enlightenment is coming to understand that you really don't have a soul, that you really don't have an Atman. I will say that just as there are different forms of Judaism and Christianity and Islam, there are also different branches of Buddhism, and some branches of Buddhism have a different view of the Atman, but here I'm talking about the major branches <clears throat> of Buddhism, which we'll talk about later on. So, at the age of 80, the Buddha achieved nirvana, uh, also, well, it was the equivalent of moksha, which is liberation. He was liberated from the cycle of life and death, the cycle of samsara. Now, there's no continuous story of the Buddha's life, um, from ancient times anyways, but there are numerous uh, Buddhist sources that talk about different parts of his life, and the most important of these early sources is called the Pali Canon. Pali is um, the name of the, uh, the language that this group of texts was written in. Pali is a, it's a language that's related to Sanskrit. It's a little bit um, younger version of the Sanskrit language. It's related to Sanskrit in the same way that, let's say, Spanish and Italian are related to Latin. All right. So the Pali Canon is the oldest uh, canonical Buddhist text, and it contains a number of different traditions, individual writings, and it's divided into three parts, or sometimes it's called three baskets. The first basket is the basket called Discourses, and this contains sermons of the Buddha that were recorded or written down later uh, when somebody recalled them. So discourses is one basket. The second basket is called monastic discipline, describes how monks in the Buddhist tradition, monks and nuns, I should say, are supposed to live. And the third is called higher teachings. So these are the three baskets that the Pali Canon is divided into. You might compare it with the, uh, the Jewish Canon, which uh, is also divided into three parts, the law, the prophets, and the writings. <clears throat> one sutra in the Pali, Pali Canon, a sutra is a book, one sutra in the Pali Canon is called the Discourse of the Great Decease, decease as in death, and it recounts the last few months of the Buddha's life. 
Um, there are other early Buddhist texts from the 1st to the 3rd century CE, so this is long after the Buddha died, but maybe six to 800 years after his death. These are still relatively early in the history of Buddhism. And some of these texts also recount events from the Buddha's life, some of them more <laughs> fantastical than some of the others. So for Buddhists uh, who revere the Buddha, now I should say that just like Muslims don't worship Muhammad, Buddhists do not worship Buddha, at least the mainstream versions of Buddhism, uh, in the mainstream versions of Buddhism, they don't worship the Buddha. They see him as an enlightened figure, a teacher, uh, a guide. Um, so for Buddhists, there are four events in the Buddha's life that are especially significant. His birth, his enlightenment, his first sermon, and his death. And the place where these four events took place are marked by shrines in uh, modern-day India or Nepal, wherever they took place. And uh, people, uh, Buddhists, and, and I should say people of other religious faiths too, make pilgrimages to these sites. All right, let's talk a little bit first about the Buddha's birth. The Buddha's mother had a dream that a white baby elephant entered her side during pregnancy. Apparently, this was a good thing. Uh, it was just an auspicious sign. Uh, it was traditional in that time for women to return to their ancestral families to give birth, and so she packed up and was on her way home, according to the story. But on the way uh, home, she was still traveling when she went into labor, and she gave birth standing up, hanging onto the branches of, uh, of a particular kind of tree called a sal tree. And the baby was born from her side, sort of like a uh, spontaneous cesarean section, I suppose. The baby was born from her side without pain. Um, there's a similar story uh, to this in the Vedic literature about the god Indra, who was born from his mother's side. Uh, eschewing the traditional route through the birth canal. So the Buddha follows this path also. There are various other supernatural signs accompanying his birth, including a report that he stood up as soon as he was born and he walked seven steps. Then he declared himself chief of the world. Reminds me of uh, Titanic and Leonardo DiCaprio when he's standing on the, the bow of the Titanic. He calls himself, I guess it's the stern actually. Anyways, calls himself I'm the king of the world. So that's the Buddha. That's his birth. All right, the next important event is his enlightenment. Now, remember I said that when the Buddha was a young man, he was raised in a wealthy family, and his father tried to shield him from the bad things of life, uh, things like sickness, aging, and death. Um, you know, his father tried to shield him from those bad things. And so on journeys outside the city, when uh, the, the young boy came along, his father sought to have the streets cleared of the sick and the poor. Um, but eventually, on one of those journeys, it so happened that uh, either luck or the gods conspired together to uh, allow the Buddha to see an old man. I should say Siddhartha because he wasn't the Buddha yet. Allowed Siddhartha to see an old man, a sick man, and a corpse. And uh, this is how he learned that all people are vulnerable to sickness, to aging, and eventually to death. And so he began pondering these things. Uh, on a subsequent journey outside the city, he ran across a shramana, that is an ascetic, who was pa practicing the shramana traditions, wearing an orange robe, as they were wont to do. They still wear these orange robes today, I should say. Um, and this shramana, of course, was wearing, living an austere lifestyle, depending on alms. You know, who knows? He may have been a Jain or something like that. Um, and so the Buddha was impressed by this, and he found himself a religious teacher. Uh, well, he left his, his parents, his wife, his son, and he became a Shramana. He found himself a religious uh, teacher, and he began studying with them. And one of the first things he did was he began learning different meditation techniques, and he tried different things, and uh, he was able to achieve a deep spiritual peace. Uh, then he studied with another guru who had uh, different techniques. Uh, one of these techniques was a, a way of severe austerity known as the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. And he tried the way of severe austerity for a while, but it just didn't work for him. 
Uh, so I guess that's why he didn't become a Jain, because that's a way of severe austerity. He came to understand that um, the path to enlightenment was really more based on uh, a moderate a moderate way of living. And so he, you know, like I say, he did this for six years, trying out different things, uh, meditating in different ways. And eventually one night while he was sitting beneath a banyan tree, uh, which later became known as the Bodhi tree, uh, and Bodhi is related to the word Buddha, it means enlightened, enlightenment tree. So one night he was sitting beneath this banyan tree and he obtained three different kinds of true knowledge. The ability to recall details of his past lives in great detail, right? The ability to see the death and rebirth of others in accordance with their karma. We'll talk more about karma later. And he also uh, learned the Four Noble Truths. Now this uh, knowledge, this true knowledge that he got is very reminiscent of the uh, concept of Kavala Janana that we talked about in Jainism last week, or omniscience is one way to uh, translate those Sanskrit words, Kavala Janana. So the Buddha got this omniscience during this vision, and at this point, he becomes the Buddha. Um, now, what about these four noble truths? The four noble truths that he learned were, number one, the truth of suffering. Uh, this word suffering is dukkha. And we usually translate it suffering, but it can also be translated as anxiety or dissatisfaction. Uh, the Buddha said or learned that suffering or dukkha was um, something that was characteristic of the human condition and all seeking after temporal things, he came to understand, is ultimately unsatisfying. You may not be suffering like in pain, but you're never going to achieve um, the goals and the dreams that you have for yourself because uh, true happiness is basically unattainable. And this led to the second noble truth, which is the truth of the origin of suffering. Why do people suffer? Well, this is found uh, that this concept of suffering that it's universal, a universal condition is also found in the Hebrew Bible in the book of Job, where uh, one of Job's friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, says, man is born to suffer as the sparks fly upward. Just as sparks from a fire always go up, that's the natural course of things, so people naturally suffer. So the Buddha came to that same realization. The truth of the origin of suffering was the second noble truth. Um, how does suffering originate? Well, it it originates when someone tries to either acquire or to retain pleasurable things and avoid unpleasurable things. And by striving to hang on to what's good and to avoid what's bad, this leads to the cycle of samsara or reincarnation. That's where suffering originates because you're trying to hang on to something that you really can't hang on to. So the third noble truth is the truth of the cessation of suffering. How does suffering end? Putting an end uh, to suffering requires putting an end to seeking to acquire or to retain or to avoid. This is how you escape from suffering, not avoiding the suffering itself, but seeking to avoid uh, even the desire to acquire or hang on to things, retain or to avoid. And finally, the fourth noble truth is the truth of the path to the cessation of suffering. How do you get to uh, the point where you learn how to uh, uh, to cease from suffering. Well, this path is called the Noble Eightfold Path, and we'll talk about it in a future uh, future video. Um, so this event is all part of the Buddha's enlightenment and later versions of this story. Remember, this all took place in a vision one night, and this is the point at which he becomes the Buddha. And later versions of this story... Uh, were further embellished with other supernatural events. The third important event in the Buddha's, Buddha's life is his first sermon. So after he achieved enlightenment, that we've just talked about, he sought out five companions. These were people that he knew that he had uh, associated with earlier in his journey to uh, towards enlightenment. And these five companions 
had abandoned him earlier because he had decided to abandon the idea of extreme asceticism. But when he went and sought them out and he explained what he had come to understand, uh, this is a sermon called Setting in Motion the Wheel of the Dharma. Um, and remember, Dharma means law or proper behavior or even religion or duty. It can be translated in that way. So he preached this little sermon to his friends, setting in motion the wheel of the Dharma, and all five of them were convinced and adopted his teachings. And this event is recognized as the founding of Buddhism. This is where the Buddha won his first converts. And soon he gathered many more followers. And remember, he continued preaching for 45 years, traveling around India, uh, northeastern India anyways, and sharing his, uh, his insights. And finally, the fourth event in his life is his death, the fourth uh, important event. As death approached, <clears throat> the Buddha became sick and he knew he was dying, but he refused to appoint a successor to himself. And at the end, he lay down between two sal trees. Remember, this is the same type of tree that uh, he was supposedly born under. And uh, these salt trees bloomed, even though it was out of season. So it was a miraculous uh, indication that the Buddha had uh, attained, uh, was about to attain nirvana. And uh, the Buddha gave instructions to his disciples. And then he slipped into unconsciousness, passed through several layers of trance before entering nirvana, uh, which is the ultimate stillness of mind uh, and abandonment of the self. And this is associated, uh, for Buddhists, is associated with moksha, liberation from samsara, the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth.